Hello to everybody on the UK Clown Book Club. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here with Mary and Todd tonight to start our um, countdown to Bloody Scotland and um, talk, talk to you about the release of her latest book, Old Bones Lie. If you could um, please give us a summary of the plot, please. Sure. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. No, um, thank thanks so much for inviting me, Alex. Old Bones Lie, which um, has been out for just over a month, begins on a Saturday night when two couples are having a takeaway together. The men work together, they're prison officers, and the women are friends as well. And the doorbell goes just when they're about to have their takeaway. One of the men goes to answer the door and he comes back into the room, backing in with a gun pointed at his chest, two men in balaclavas. The men then get the, the, the ladies, tie their hands, blindfold them, take them out and put them in a van. And then they come back in and say to the, the men, uh, the, the two prison officers, there's a job we need you to do for us. And we don't know any more about it at that point. It cuts away. And then coincidentally, a few miles away across, across town at nearby um, village called Garbridge, a woman's body is found in uh, her garden shed. And Claire, D.I. Claire Mackay, who's my protagonist, is called in to investigate. She then finds out that there are two prison officers missing and that yeah. a prison van has been hijacked and that the wives yeah. are missing as well. And she thinks that it's all connected, but yeah. her bosses don't think it is connected. So yeah. it starts to be a little bit tricky for her to investigate. That's a good summary of the first few chapters. But for me, it's a this isn't going to be the first time I've heard your voice because I'm used to listening to your voice on the audio book. Oh, yes, yeah. Minutes. What's it been like recording it? Because, of course, this one's only just come out. Yeah, um, well, it's it has its moments. Um, I recorded the very first audio book of See Them Run during lockdown. And... At that point, there was no option to go to a studio um, and I had a very kind of noisy computer, a uh, big computer tower, because I, I don't usually work on a laptop. Um, and I was working with an engineer down the line using um, a kind of software a little bit like this where we were able to talk to each other. And we made simultaneous recordings using software called Audacity, which is great for doing audio recordings and every sort of 80 minutes or so 70 80 minutes would stop save the recording it's a massive file so i would send it using um, software called we transfer which lets you send very big files and he would then save that would have a 10 minute break and then we would go on with the next one and it did that for about two and a half days but because it was at home um there's things like birds tweeting outside yeah. and the bin lorry comes on a Monday. <laughs> it was always a Monday. And then there were other things like hedge trimmers and uh, plus my computer itself was making lots of noises. And one, one really almost dreadful moment, I had been recording for about 70, 80 minutes and I had just stopped and saved the recording and I was just about to send it to the engineer using WeTransfer when my computer shut down, completely cut out. Oh, and what happened was I had so many duvets and pillows all around the computer to kind of stop the hum and the noise and all the rest of it, that um, it had overheated. And I almost, I was within about 10 seconds of losing an hour and 20 minutes worth of recording. Oh. Which would have just been awful. Um, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so that was the, kind of the biggest challenge. And the other thing that I didn't realise was that the microphone picks up everything, absolutely everything. So if you have the tiniest sip of water, that I'm mean, talking about less than a teaspoonful, that makes a noise going down. I didn't know that until I heard it over the microphone. Um, if you, if I have, I had to eat very, very quickly when we broke for lunch. I'd have a very quick sandwich because 
that would make a noise as, as it was kind of going down your gullet as well. Mm. Um, it's just little things like that that you don't think about. I had notices on, I had to take all the phones out of the wall and I had notices on the front door telling people not to ring and, and so on. But there was always something and the engineer would say, oh, I can hear an aeroplane because there's a an airport quite close by. And uh, so you'd have to wait for the plane to go over and then start again. Yeah. So, it, I mean, quite apart from the tongue twisters and everything, uh, you know, kind of narrating an audio book as a non-actor, um, yeah. it was technically quite challenging. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, you learn a lot about the process as well. So it, it was interesting. I can imagine that um, deciding to do it yourself must have been a... What made you decide to do it yourself? Oh, always, you know, I, I, well, um, one of the things that happened in lockdown was that my agents decided they would try and have lots of videos of their clients reading bits from the book and so on. And they asked if I would do one. So I, I recorded one a bit like this and um, sent it to them and they put it up on YouTube. And at about the same time, um, they had an offer for the audio rights for the book. And my agent said, right, we've all listened to your video and we think you could, you should record the audio book yourself. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm not an actor. I can't do stuff like that. And she said, yes, but it would build your brand. It'd be really good for your, you know, kind of getting your, your name out there and all the rest of it. I thought, well, I'll see you. And so I sort of thought about it and they kind of said, it was a really good idea. Mm -hmm. I'm still not convinced it's a good idea because I think an actor would do it so much better. It's only when you hear the professionals that you realise just how good they are. But what sort of swung it for me was, she said, you know what every sentence means. You know what, um, you know, when something's tense, you know, when something's exciting, you know, the book inside out. And no one will will read it with the insight that that you have. Yeah. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. Um, and every time I do it, I think that's the last time. I'm not doing the next one. I'm never doing another one again. And then it comes around, and you forget. Um, so I don't know. Sometimes I think it's a good idea. Mostly, I think it's not. <laughs> but well, I, I think that it adds its own flavour because, of course, when you're having um, such a unique accent. You can tell that you can tell that it's you, and you can tell that it's a Scottish pop. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. and as I say, you know, I hear when I'm writing, I do hear the voices in, not literally hear voices, but I, I imagine the voices in my head, um, and I know the intonation and, and the way they they speak to each other, the characters. So I suppose that gives me an advantage, which hopefully makes up for the lack of. Um, acting kind of training and things yeah for people that have read the book they'll know that um a couple of your books start with start with weddings what why um do you think weddings are a good start for a time novel do you know i have not actually realized that now that you say that that you're right there are two books that start with weddings i haven't thought about that i think um i i sometimes i start with a crime and sometimes I start with a bit of normal life being interrupted when Claire, the DI, learns about a crime. And I think weddings are such good fun, particularly in Scotland. If you've not been to a Scottish wedding, then you must contrive to make friends with someone in Scotland who's going to be getting married. Because Scots Scottish weddings are brilliant. You, you have all the usual, you know, sort of the ceremony and the speeches and the meal and all the rest of it. And then quite often there'll be a Cayley which is a Scottish country dance. Mm. And you can imagine people have been drinking champagne since midday or earlier and stuff like that. And so by the time the Cayley comes along, everybody is very um, merry and exuberant. Mm. And the dancing just gets wilder and wilder. And I, with the first book that I wrote, I, I loved the idea that um, there would be this mad Cayley going on. And, and in the middle of it, this person gets tempted outside to meet someone um, and, and meets meets his maker rather than yeah. the person he thinks he's going to meet. Um, and then in the fifth one, um, next it's to the line, it's Claire it's is, it's is attending one. the wedding of her ex-boyfriend. 
And I quite liked the idea. I, I was sort of messing about with it at first, making it look as if it was her wedding at the start. Yeah. Um, and then you realise, no, she's, she's there. And it's a bit tense for her because she's watching her ex-boyfriend get married and uh, she doesn't yeah. really like his new wife. And, um, so I wanted to introduce a bit of tension there. And then the fact that a crime happens and she's off duty. It's her weekend off. She shouldn't really be called in, but she can't help herself. So, yeah. Um, the ex-boyfriend is quite an interesting angle because although although he's involved in although he's involved in book one, you don't really involve him in until um, book five. Again, yes. really. yeah, I yeah. think he, does he come back in? I think he comes yeah. comes into maybe the second or the third second one. I, think, I can't remember. Yeah, a minor role in the second one. I think, yeah, uh -huh. I mean originally yeah. when when I you know lots of of writers will tell you that they've got a book buried in a hard disk that will never see the light of day, and I'm no exception. Um, my first book had much more about her, uh, the breakdown of her relationship with him. And it, when I sort of abandoned that book and thought, right, I'm going to start again and, and, and write from the beginning again, I decided not to do that, just to kind of drip it in as a little bit of backstory. Um, and he comes in and out. He's just the book that I'm um, editing at the moment, which will be the next one out next summer. He's come into that again. And yeah. I just can't resist. It's like an itch I have to scratch. He's just hopeless. He's, a, he's honest. <laughs> he needs to just give him a slap and tell him to go away. But he's just, yeah. you know, he thinks that everything's wonderful and, and you know, that there's no tension at all but even though he's got married and claire's got somebody else he just thinks you know oh hello claire we're, you know we're best friends and um yeah oh he just he's such work yeah it's a strange relationship yes it is i don't really know why <laughs> i think that it's quite interesting because um during the um a couple of the interrogations um she knows the law because she helps him study it and then yes a, co a colleague's is uh, a bit surprised when she says says about what offence they might be charged with. I think that's yes. quite, quite an interesting little quirk. Yes, I quite like that because um, although she's she's not qualified in law, she knows bits about it, and and sometimes she'll just drop these things in, and and someone will be like, mm, "How did you know that?" sort of thing. So it it just it's just fun to do, and there's some very interesting quirky bits of law. If you can get your hands on them, um, that that uh, are fun to just sort of play about with. I, li I like the law. I'm interested in it. Maybe in another life I might have studied. I actually, I think I'm too lazy to study law. There's too much work, but I, I do quite like it. Yeah, it's it's quite it's quite a challenge to um, incorporate that into work because I've been trying to do it and I, I don't know whether. I... I studied. I studied law myself, but oh, did you? I get worried about having to put too too much of the law into the work yes. and telling the reader too much. Yeah. I think it's like any kind of research. Um, you probably should only put in about ten percent of what you've found out, but it's yeah. when you've done all the work, it's tempting to to put a lot in um, to, to to prove that you know what you're talking about. Um, Anyway, I do. I didn't know you. I'll have to come and pick your brains when I've got law questions. Yeah, you do have some quirky plot lines. I must admit, the uh, the second one, the kidnap, is quite good. Yeah, I, well, when I was writing the second book, I kind of didn't. I I have a horror of being accused of writing the same book every time, um, and it it would be an easy trap to fall into. I think when you've you've got your your set of uh, your police characters and you just think right we'll have somebody killed so I decided that the second book wasn't going to be a murder um, it was going to be an abduction but then I spoke to my editor and she said I think you've probably got to kill somebody you know we, we, we need yeah. to have body or... so as the book went on um, I think someone was found in a skip um, when it, I, I, and you know so I, I did introduce a little bit of crime but I wanted it very much to be a different type of crime um <coughs> excuse me and i do try every every time i'm approaching a new book to think right what can i do that's just a little bit different this time um eventually yeah. i'm gonna, gonna have to sort of come back full circle and 
kind of re pick up some of these ideas again. Yeah, because I know social media and um, and you know relationships on online. You covered that. You covered that in one of your books, and I yes. know that not a lot of people have done that. Um, I've I've thought about doing speed dating in one of mine, but it's quite. Um, although relationships are such a key part of crime novels, why do you think more authors haven't done it? In terms of things like speed dating, speed dating or like relationship based. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. first of all, I'm going to say I love the idea of doing speed dating because so many people meet so many people um, in such a short space of time. I did do, as you as you know, um, on uh, sort of dating through um, dating websites in. Uh, Number three, I think it was. Um, yeah, three or four. Anyway, yeah. um, the problem with, I suppose, relationship based crime is that it's it's like true life most murderers and victims know each other the vast majority of, of murders are domestic and it's very unusual to have what we write about where you have an unknown killer um it's more a case of can you get the evidence to prove it um so i think if you if it, if it is domestic then how do you hide that from your reader, or if you're not hiding it, if it's a more a why done it rather than a who done it, how do you make that interesting to hold the reader? Because if 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 the reader knows that um, Jim's wife's killed him, um, how do you hold their interest? Um, and I guess that's why people go for unknown um, killer victim relationships, or perhaps unknown to the police um yeah. that, that's my guess but but uh, i guess that's why i don't do it um, i'm always trying to find a relationship that isn't obvious but then you have to play fair with the the reader as well you, you can't yeah. just suddenly parachute someone in nine tenths of the way through and say and here's the killer you didn't know who mm -hmm. he was but you know he was passing through town and now he's back um you have to yeah. give the reader <laughs> a chance yeah <laughs> I must admit, I must admit that is one of my big, big bugbears. But, but as a now, but as I'm now um, on the writing side of the thing, yeah, I can see why. It's not so easy, is it? <laughs> no, no, it's not. No. Um, I did read somewhere. I can't remember who it was that said it. That you should introduce your killer within the first like three or four pages or something like that. But I don't think you can always do that because. Um, I try I try to have several plot lines going in my novels, um, which maybe don't seem as though they're related, but but in some way will connect as the book goes on. And I think to have the killer at the first chapter of every book would be a bit of a challenge, I think. But you do have to have them in pretty early on, to be fair to the reader. Yeah. If you've got several plot lines running at once, um, in in the new one, you had two different teams trying to solve ele elements of the case, but you've not really done that before. Why did you decide to bring that in this time? Right. Um, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Normally in a book, I would aim to have three plot lines going. And that doesn't necessarily mean I'll always manage to do three, but I'll try to come up with three. And they'll be of different levels of intensity or seriousness. So there'll be a killing or an abduction or, or some very serious crime. That will be the main one. There'll, there'll be a trivial one that might be, I don't know, you know, um, maybe somebody burgling houses or th that's not trivial. I don't mean that. But, um, you know, kind of less serious from the investigative point of view. And then there'll yeah. be perhaps one that falls somewhere in the middle. And I'll want these three to be connected. And the aim will be not to connect them in the way that the reader might think. That, that's, that's the plan. It doesn't always work that way. Um, so I'll, the reason I, I separated out the two investigations was to make life difficult for Claire. 
because yeah. she believed that the the killing of the person and the disappearance of the prison officers and subsequently the the, the kind of springing of the prisoner are connected and um I'll, I'll leave it to the reader to find out whether or not that is the case yeah. but i wanted claire to be not allowed to have anything to do with the prisoners i wanted her to be forced to connect to concentrate on the the murder the body in the garden shed and but to believe that there was a connection um yeah and she doesn't know until she gets further through the book if there's a connection and what that connection is and why mm. why the two crimes were separated out. Yeah, um, I think that that kind of reflects reality a bit more because um, that's how it happens in, in um, reality with lots of people in the station. Uh, you seem to have um, brought a few more characters into this book. I think there's about four new ones, but the, the, to have a proper universe, you do need a lot of characters in them. Well, it's I, my books have four core characters: Claire, her detective sergeant Chris, uh, Jim, who is the desk sergeant, um, who really has a lot more involvement in crimes than than a desk sergeant would, and Sarah, who is a, a young, um, idealistic, uh, uniformed constable, and she's engaged to Chris. They're a couple, and I have them running through all the books, but to have them only the characters who are involved in the investigation wouldn't work it wouldn't make any sense at all um and the other thing that would happen in reality is that um a team would be brought in a major investigation team or a major inquiry team would be brought in by police scotland to oversee these these crimes the investigation of these crimes um but i don't like that because what happens in real life in Police Scotland, because it's a unified force, is that any team can come from anywhere. It's who's available to be, you know, they can come from different parts of Scotland and they'll be brought in and stationed temporarily there to investigate the crime. And that doesn't make for a good series. Um, so I play about with that and I mess about with it. But Claire has to have a detective chief inspector come in because that that would be the very least that would happen in a crime like this, potentially even a superintendent. Um, and I like to mix that up a little bit. So I have, um, I think I've used three different ones. Um, yeah, three in, different ones. Yes, three different in time. Ones. so I'll bring them in. <coughs> but because I don't want always to be writing the same book, um, I'll vary who is brought in. And, and that would be what would happen um, in reality. So in Old Bones Lie, she's never met this one before. This is a completely new one. So she doesn't quite know how to take him and how to work with him. Um, and then there are the officers that she begs, borrows and steals because St Andrew's station is very small. It wouldn't even have a Claire, wouldn't have a chief inspector, an inspector or a chief inspector. Um, they would be stationed elsewhere at another bigger station. Um, so I do have her bringing in cops from other stations and uh, and I try to keep them to a minimum that where I've still got the reality the realism of an investigation because if someone was killed there would be god I don't know 30 40 officers working on it yeah. depending on how serious it was um, if it was a genuine unexplained murder and they thought someone was running around that was a danger to the public there would be a lot of officers working on this but that's not sustainable in a book people would, would not you know they, they would lose track um so i try to keep to what i think is an okay number that that won't drive readers crazy because who, who's this one who's that one and whether i get it right or not i'm not sure um I, you know i just muddle through <laughs> Well, with this one, I, I, I can can see why you did it, but I was a bit surprised to have so many new characters in the, in the yes. book. Cause it, yeah. Yes, well, obviously, um, Chris has to be sidelined because one of the missing prison officers is his cousin. So he can't, he wouldn't be allowed to work on the yeah. investigation. And that was deliberate. And I've taken a bit of flack for that because a few readers have said that they missed the Claire and Chris banter 
Chris was still there. He was on one of the side issues. Um, but uh, I brought in a new detective sergeant uh, called Max Evans and tried to make him completely different from Chris so that Chris would be a bit, yeah, who's he when he's at home sort of thing, a bit grumpy about it. Um, so, yes, I suppose I did introduce a, a, a raft of new characters and I hope that some of them will will stay. Max is staying into the next book. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I must admit, I do, I do like Max because he brings in one of the one of the side um, stories that I want to ask you about. Mm. You do a lot of baking because Max is into his coffee, and then of course the receptionist makes cake. Yes, Zoe. Yes, I love Zoe. Um, I used to do a lot of baking, and now that my children have all flown the nest, I don't dare because I would end up eating it all. But um, I used to make a a homemade um, pudding every single day when they were at home. Well, almost every day, probably five days a week anyway. You know, so it would be a, a sponge cake or some scones or or kind of pancakes or whatever. I, I, you know, I used to do a lot of baking and I'm a big fan of puddings and desserts. So whenever I'm planning a meal, I'll, I'll think, yeah, we'll have a main course, but what we're going to have for dessert. Um, so Christmas time, there'll, there'll be maybe four of us around the table. And we'll have four desserts. Everybody chooses a dessert. And the lovely thing about that is that you can have them for breakfast on Boxing Day. And stuff like that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I really love, I could just have puddings, nothing else. Um, so, yes, I do. I, I'm living vicariously through Zoe. Um, and in fact, one of the tray bakes that she made, I made as well. And it's probably my favourite. It's a kind of white chocolate blondie with a strawberry compote drizzled through it. Oh, oh lovely just amazing i'll have to next time i'm going to see you i'll have to make some and, and bring it because it's just fabulous oh, it's like a thousand great. calories a piece that sounds great um, oh, it's I, nice. yeah i love um baking myself i used to bake for the um for my uh, poker buddies then i used to do um you know great British bake i used to do uh, each each um week i used to do one of the recipes from the show um, oh, in fact, what, what's your kind of go-to then? What would be your fail-safe? If I was coming for a cup of tea? It's got to be, um, oh, I think it's got to be uh, probably um, some kind of a, a tray bake, something something simple, but I do like to make a scone. Mm. Yeah. Plain or fruit or cheese? I'm more of a cheese, but I do like the occasional fruit. I love a cheese scone with a bowl of soup. That's yeah. Yummy. Yeah. Hungry. You put mustard in with your cheese. I don't. I put KN in though. Yeah. Um, but I haven't thought like mustard powder, do you mean? Yeah. Ooh. Mustard powder in with the cheese. I might try that. It. Thank you. Lots of pepper. Yeah. I love black pepper. Yeah. Makes it a little bit gives it a bit of a kick, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um mm. when when thinking about um other my other minor elements of your book, um there's a lot of reference to IT. I know it's important to one of the plots, but it does seem to run through the series. Eh? Mm. Do you, what, why do you think you like IT so much? In your books? Well, um, partly I, I used to to teach um, at a college, and one of the things I would teach would be Microsoft programs, um, kind of you know spreadsheets and databases and things like that. Um, and I, but I never, I, I didn't do computing. I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't even know where to start with, with that kind of thing, but I'm interested in it. And I'm very conscious that these days um, the police would use a lot of um, technology to, to help. And I have some really lovely friends who are very free with the advice. Um, so I can go to them and I can say, I can remember the one where it was, Oh, gosh, what was I trying to do? I was trying to trace some emails and um, someone showed me how to go into the guts of an email and find and get lots of information that you could then search on. And I, st I, I now can't even remember how to do it. Um, but, you know, stuff like that fascinates me. And I love the idea of um, being able to sit at a desk without going outside 
and find stuff out um, and track people down and, and find their digital trail and, and stuff like that. And I would love, love, love that there's, there's a building in, in Scotland um, near a place called Gart Kosh, which is over um, towards Glasgow way, a little bit south of southwest of Glasgow or southeast of Glasgow. Um, and this is where uh, this is called the Scottish Crime Campus. And this is where all the, the weird technology stuff goes on. And I would love to get inside Gartkosh, but you can't get in mm -hmm. because, you know, even yeah. police officers who go in have to give up their work phones, their personal mobile phones and be scanned and all the rest of it. And I was playing about with that a little bit in book three um, when, when I ha um, had Claire go to this this place and meet this ethical hacker who was um, yeah. looking into things, let's say. Uh, so I, I'm fascinated by it and I would love to know more about it. I, I you know, I, I do a little bit of research and I ask people questions and then I put something in a book and, and, and hope it sounds credible. Um, I just well, think it's so interesting. Yeah. Um, I just think that um, the the fact that you've got, the Kaiser's got such a good relationship with, um, Claire's got such a good relationship with the woman in the IT department. Yes. It's, it's quite a nice little, nice little um, story, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, it's, Cooperation is is essential in in the police force, and there's there's no police officer knows these things. They they go to the experts, and, and there are all these departments that can assist with their specialist knowledge, fraud departments, and and all sorts. And um, so it's teamwork, and and I try to reflect that. I'm sure what I do isn't you know isn't really that that accurate, but as long as it's credible enough that it doesn't spoil the story, then that that's what I'm shooting for. Yeah, that's what I'm always told. I've been advised that on a number of occasions. You know, being a hundred percent accurate will only bore the reader. But yes. uh, you're not writing a, a kind of a, <laughs> a manual on, you know, how, how an investigation and, and police investigations are dull, dull, dull. It's going over the same ground again and again, questioning the same people endlessly. Um, all you know it's if you were to write the reality then nobody would get past page six i certainly wouldn't um so you have to mess with it a wee bit what would you say that is the most most fun thing that you've enjoyed messing with oh right well it would probably be in let's have a think in book three lies to tell um where Claire was early on, she was taken to this very secure building, which I just made up. And um, I, I sort of went online and I thought, I actually, this, this is awful, but I actually researched the plans that Donald Trump had for this fence or this wall or whatever it was going to be um, between America and Mexico. And I, I researched how that was going to be built. And I thought, right, that's the wall I'm going to have um, to keep people out of this this kind of specialist installation. And I, I, I sort of put Claire into this. I just made this whole thing up as to how I imagine it would be. And then she was introduced to this person who's an ethical hacker. And I love the idea of ethical hacking where um, there are people who are employed to do what's called penetration testing, where they try to hack in, what a great job, being paid to try and hack into an organisation to see, to identify their vulnerabilities. Um, and I think that that was such fun. Um, and again, you know, I, I did do a little bit of research into ethical hacking and how it would work, but I made a lot of that up as well. Um, and I think I enjoyed that because I don't suppose ethical hackers really talk about what they do. So I thought, unless this is being yeah. read by an ethical hacker, I'm going to get away with this. We'll be OK here. Um, and I love the idea of creating this multi-skilled, um, incredibly intelligent person who was the ethical hacker. And without giving anything in the, the book away, um, the crime ultimately was, or, or the perpetrator, was ultimately brought to justice through Claire's friend that you referred to, Diane, down at the technical support office because of her, you know, she wasn't this big fancy 
highly skilled, highly trained ethical hacker person. She was just a good, solid, dogged person who looked and saw things and thought, I know how to kind of get on top of this. Um, so I think that was the most fun I ever had writing a book. Yeah, I must admit that that was a very interesting book. But the um, bit I found as interesting is the uh, little little dog that you got introduced in book one. It is like a little crucial character that I was reading on your bio um, um, that uh, there might be a reason for that. <laughs> yes. Well, there's, this is a sad tale. Um, my daughter um, acquired this dog, this, the dog called Zeus, and he's he's a thug, an absolute thug, badly behaved and all the rest of it. And then she got the chance of a lovely flat uh, to rent, but she wasn't allowed to have the dog there. So I said, OK, well, you know, the flat is too good to turn down. I'll take the dog because, you know, I, I, I've got time and you're not you don't have time i'll take him and look after him until we just work out what you're going to do and so he has stayed really he's just sort of on permanent holiday with me and she's gotten tonight which is fine because she's now in her own flat and she can have him and that's fine but it actually worked quite well having him here because i've got more room than she does and all the rest of it anyway he's as i say he's a badly behaved boy and i decided to take him to dog training Oh, Alex, mm -hmm. um, it maybe wasn't hell, but you could surely see it from there. It was just the worst experience of my life. So I would go along Sunday morning at nine o'clock. I mean, Sunday morning at nine o'clock is the time to be sitting with the papers and a croissant. It is not the time to be standing in a field, which is why I put that into book four when it was kind of snowy and horrible. And the mm -hmm. one problem that our dog has is that he is kind of aggressive towards other dogs, born out of fear, I think, but he's quite a powerful dog, so you have to be really careful. And I used to come home, my hands would be red raw, trying to hold on to him, with the lead cutting into my hand. And there would be, this square would be set up and the dogs would all be inside the square with their owners. And they would do things like crisscross walking, which is in the book, book four, where yeah. two dogs have to walk kind of diagonally towards each other and pass each other and all the rest of it. I couldn't even get inside the square. We mm -hmm. had to walk outside the square. <laughs> and every time he passed another dog, he would oh, 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 kind of jumping at him. And I was utter nightmare. I stood it for about six weeks. And then I thought, I'm not going back. I am not going back. I have had enough of this. So having said that, the trainer was excellent. And I learned a lot from him that I have since put into to practice. And he's a lot better. But I thought when I created Benji, I thought, right, I'm going to get this out. I'm going to exercise this ghost and mm -hmm. make Benji just as badly behaved as, as our dog. I mean, he's adorable. I love him to bits. Um, and he's so much better now. He can walk past dog, other dogs and he's fine. It's, it's worked out quite well. But in the beginning, oh, my goodness, he was such work. And so that's why I've given Claire such a hard time with Benji. Um, yeah. I, I just I've had an email from um, a reader who said, you know, hello, Marion, you know, thank you very much for writing the books. Very much enjoyed them. But we really must have a conversation about Benji. This is not on. She is leaving him for far too long. No wonder he rips into the oven gloves and all the rest. She really told me off. I had to, <laughs> had to reply and say, well, you know, she has Moira, her, her neighbour, and uh, Moira's great with Benji. She comes in and walks him twice a day and all the rest of it. So, you know, Benji gets... but. So yeah, I mean um, the um, relationship with uh, Claire's love interests and Benji yes. is quite interesting too, isn't it? Yes, I, I sort of, I mean, it, to begin with, in the in the first book, he was he was not going to be um, anything to do with Claire. He was he was just a thorn in her side, um, and then she kind of got in tow with this other guy and then by the end of book two I thought I'm going to mess with that and then book three I started to reintroduce the the man that she's with now and uh oh what's she gonna do worry 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 and I, I think I left book three on a cliffhanger because I genuinely didn't decide who 
who um, she was going to choose because she was then asked to choose between the two of them. And I thought, I don't know who she's going to choose. So I just left it yeah. and I got a lot of flack for that as well. And then come the yeah. start of book four, um, she'd made one decision and, you know, we'll work that through anyway. Now he has moved in and they're living in a reasonable amount of domestic bliss. He's very good with a dog and he has a nine to five job. So he can be at home to sort of be there with Benji when she's out all night doing this, that and the next thing. Um, so, but I keep thinking, you know, she's been quite content now for a couple of books. Is it time to mess with that? I don't know. Well, well, that's always the best bit. Yes, isn't the, it? They're messing, it, 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 messing it, around with the characters because if they're all nice and happy, it makes it a bit... Yeah, nobody Monday. wants to read about wedded bliss, stuff like that. So I don't know what's in store for, for her in her love life, but um, yeah. it's probably not going to be good, is it? <laughs> um, yeah, because it starts off a bit of rocket. I mean, what what made you decide to have her be like um, start off interested in like I think she was um, she did um, gun she was a gun expert as part of the in the first book, and uh, it it's um, a lot of um, people think that. UK uh, police um, probably should um, not carry guns. So, what made you decide that one? Carry a gun. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know um, that. Yeah, that was part of her backstory, and it because for anyone who doesn't know, it you learn in the first book that she had been a firearms officer and she had shot and killed a young lad who she had believed was about to, to shoot her. Um, and, and, you know, that the information about that is in the first book, so I won't say too much more about it. But towards the end of that book, it almost comes full circle because the incident that she's involved with, trying to, to kind of bring this person to justice, means bringing in a firearms team and she's, she's back face to face with colleagues that she worked with. And in fact, one of them is um, proposing to testify against her in an inquiry into this shooting of this. This um, It's not an inquiry, it's a, the, the family of the, the, the lad who she shot are bringing a private prosecution against her. And this other firearms officer is going to be testifying against her. So there's all these sort of tensions and things. Um, and I'd known a little bit about uh, the firearms and licensing that had happened in Scotland following the, the Dunblane shooting. Um, I'd, I'd known a bit about how that was, how that came to be. And although it's unlikely that a firearms officer like Claire would then become a, a detective inspector, that, that's kind of the not the normal um, trajectory. Um, I just thought I'm going to give her a complete break because of what's happened. She needs to go from busy Glasgow, where she was in the firearms squad, to quieter St Andrews, and, and this is going to be a new start. But from time to time, I, I do sort of bring it back, and it came back in, into book three again. Um, and I guess it's just maybe something that she can't shake off because it was such a I, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to have killed someone, um, particularly yeah. when you're a police officer, where your first duty is the preservation of life. Uh, so I, I feel that Claire probably can't shake it off, and I'm not sure that I'm entirely done with that yet. I think um, I think intriguing. that might come back. Yeah, intriguing. I mean, mm. it's um, always interesting uh, why... Um, you decide with the backstory. I mean, um, when you were writing Claire, was it always going to be a series? Because the backstory is always important to the, to the first book. But, um, if it's not planned to be a series, it can be a bit different with the backstory. Yeah, it? no, it was it was always going to be a series, definitely. Um, I didn't know how many books, and I still don't know how many. I'm contracted to write another three. So after that, who knows? But... Um, I, I yeah I wanted 
I guess I'm quite lazy, basically. And I thought, you know, if you, if I write a series, then I've got my setting, I've got my my core characters, you know, and and I just need a new crime every time.